I'll never come to Monte Carlo out of season again. Not a single well-known personality in the hotel. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. So today I'm joined by Professor Lawrence Cross, who is a theoretical physicist and the author of the physics Star Trek, A Universe from Nothing, and a latest uh, book on climate change as well. So welcome to the show. It's nice to be with you virtually. All right. So you are an accomplished academic, author, scientist, and you, of course, have taught at Yale as well as Arizona State University, Case Western Reserve, and also have chaired the board of sponsors of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Um, one of the areas that you founded is uh, ASU's interdisciplinary initiative to investigate fundamental questions about the universe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, that actually, that, that program has ended uh, but uh, now, but that program we've carried out to a separate foundation, which I now run. I've now actually retired from, from ASU, and I run a foundation called the Origins Project Foundation, which is really designed to do um, what I began there, but extend it to basically mix science and culture to, to, to recognize that science is a key part of our culture and that people should be uh, given the opportunity to be exposed to the most exciting ideas that are happening throughout all of human, human academic inquiry in the 21st century, and in particular to those subjects which will address the greatest challenges we as a society need to address in the 21st century. So it's, it's a chance to bring uh, not just myself, but other well-known scientists, scholars, thought leaders to interact with the public we do it through a podcast, we do it through public events, we do it through some special video events, and actually we also sponsor some trips where people can spend a month or two, we did one in, or a week or two, we did one in the in the Mekong Delta with, uh, with uh, my colleague Richard Dawkins, another colleague, Richard Somerville, a climate scientist, which is really, actually that was caused the, that was the basis of really my decision to write my new book, The Physics of Climate Change, because the Mekong Delta is kind of like the, a perfect storm of climate change. Uh, anyway, so we the idea is to is to provide many formats. Uh, too often in our society, we separate science and culture, and science scientific ideas are fascinating. People really crave learning about them, actually, and they really love to hear from the horse's mouth. So we have Nobel Prize winning scientists. We do events with them, but we also have uh, filmmakers, journalists, uh, 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 other writers. We, we've had you know events and, and with Ian McEwen and and we're just doing one with uh, the filmmaker Werner Herzog, uh, Ricky Gervais, as well as Noam Chomsky, and, and uh, as I say, a variety of Nobel Prize winning scientists in a variety of areas. Anyway, so I think the point to, to recognize is that human, the human spectrum of culture is very broad, and we should celebrate all of it. Okay, so we're going to come back to the physics of climate change in just a few minutes, but I think going, continuing with your, your thought process there is that you've been a pretty strong advocate that, you know, science uh, needs to be very much part of the cultural dialogue and conversation as well as public policy, and that we really need to, um, you know, appreciate and, and fall back on the empirical data, the, the science and the education that, that gives us. But it I should, wonder be, it should be the basis of policy. It should be the first step. And then after that, sure, there are lots of other priorities, but let's get the empirical data and our understanding right and all agree to that. You can, as many people have said, you can choose your own opinions, but not your own facts. So, so I, I love this and I, I wonder um, practically how this can be translated given the fact that whether we're talking about media or, and certainly in the case of, let's say, special interest groups, lobbying and, and policy groups, is that, um, you know, they will pick and choose the kind of facts that pertains to or supports their particular 
special interests, right, or self-interest. So of how course. do we balance um, kind of this holistic, more, you know, partisan list type of an approach to just looking at the facts versus getting caught up in policies and, and, and part of partisanship? Well, look, I'm, there's an old saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I'm an educator. So I kind of believe that if we, if we expose people to, to, to the people who are actually doing the work and, and discuss it intelligently and, 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 and critically with skeptical questioning, that's what's most important. And I think we have to train people in this modern era where there's more, there are more facts on this phone than there are uh, than ever in school, but there are more misfacts. And we have to train people on how to, how to not always listen to their echo chambers and how to critically examine what they hear and look for many different sources. But we try, um, you know, on our panels for sometimes, we, we certainly try to prevent the, present the different perspectives. But one of the real problems with the media, and I, I'm a scientist who's involved in, in, with the media and also po the popularization of science for almost 40 years, the, often journalists are trained to think that there's two sides to every story. But the thing about science is usually one side is wrong. And so uh, I think we don't always have to look for balance, you know, in the case. Look, we don't have to have equal time for the Earth is flat, for example. And, and although there is a flat Earth society with PhDs in it. And, and I think, uh, so I think we just want to have intelligent discussion and critical discussion. And also allow open questioning. To, uh, I'm particularly concerned in the modern times right now that people are are not allowing open questioning. That people are that they're canceling people and and groups for simply asking questions that may not be politically correct. And of course, that's what's at the heart of the Enlightenment and a free and democratic society is to have critical questioning of everything. So we should try and encourage that in all discussions we have. I certainly do. And and. Um, and uh, and I guess train kids in schools not to you know how to parse and how to how to carefully not just select but to compare what they hear with other things to see if they're consistent and to look as I said many sources and to and to continue to ask questions I think I think that's the most important thing and and we one of the things I do is uh, often is we try and have events like um in some sense we're doing with you now but with the public where there's open Q and A's. Um, where people can ask their own questions, because that connection is very important, and I think people often feel like they can't be connected to to the people who are actually involved in doing things, um, and 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 that's why why I try and when we have a when I, we have an event or when I when I do something like that, I try and have the people who are actually involved in the discoveries or the journalists who are writing about these things actually on uh, involved so that we can we can. Get to the horse's mouth if you if you excuse the uh, analogy so coming back to physics of, of uh, climate change uh, tell us in terms of what is a book about and how are you using that book as a medium to ask these kind of fundamental questions and to create dialogues that perhaps maybe is lacking yeah no it's a good uh, that's a good question and it was a challenge for me what it, i actually wrote it during the pandemic when and i wrote it quicker than i've written any other book i didn't plan to but I was trying to think how I'm not a first line of responder. How can I contribute? And having just been to the Mekong, where which is going to be affected by climate change quickly, I, I and having been at the Bolden Atomic Scientist and having sort of prepared for a long time with experts, um, what I wanted to do, what what I realized that people get turned off from climate change discussions when they feel they're being told what to do, when they feel that it's being presented as a political issue and this is a precursor to being told to not drive your car or not eat meat or whatever it is. And then people automatically get their hackles up. And so what I wanted to write a, do was write a book that, even though I'm interested in public policy, that didn't have a public policy component to it. It was just the fundamental science in a way that people could understand. Now, the, one of the many misconceptions about climate change is that it requires supercomputers and you know uh, and and science that's questionable. But the fundamental science that underlies climate change is really fundamental physics. It's 150 or almost 200 years old, and it's fascinating to learn about. So I wanted to I wanted to provide everyone with enough knowledge so that they can understand what what the basic science is, what the fundamental predictions are that are inviable which ones are more are more uh, uh, questionable what more you know more involve more uh, extrapolation in the future and so, so that people could uh, could get a sense for themselves 
what the issues are, what the challenges are, and then based on their political preferences and the other priorities that they may have as either as legislators or as individuals, they can decide what policies could be done. So like most of my books, it's trying to make science accessible and fun. And in this case, the fact that I'm not a client scientist, I think was 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 important because if I, as a, as a scientist who has had experience talking to the public, if I can't translate this into a way that's accessible to people, then there's not much hope for, for that, as I said to you earlier, that initial stage. The science is not Democratic or Republican or right or left. And the initial stage of any public policy discussion should just be understanding how the world really works, which is really what I'm most interested in. I'm, you know, it's nice to, to cut down superstition and argue against that or myth, but what I really want to do is get people excited in the real world. And this is a very important aspect of the real world, which will impact, of course, on our, on our lifestyle and our society in the next century. So, you know, that was the idea. It was a modest goal in some sense. And it's a short book, which, which you know, it's, 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 a, it's a small book, you know, and, it, it, and I think that's important because it also is not so intimidating. And, and also provide, there's lots of figures there, which I think are important because not only is a, a picture worth a thousand words sometimes, but it gives people the sense of what the actual data is. And it can lead people who are interested to go further, I put a, there's a whole list of web resources at the end. Most of, you know, my books, even at the forefront of science, I don't expect to, people to come away as experts, but I expect them to get a perspective of what's happening. And then if they're really interested, to be able to then go further and look at, at more detailed sources. All right, so can you pull out maybe one or two key highlights from the book that you want to emphasize? You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in their area of sustainability and human survival on Earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. Sure. Um, the I think the first one I already mentioned to you that 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 the fundamental science of climate change is not suspect. It's, it's based on a very simple thing. Energy in equals energy out if the system isn't changing. And if the energy in is more than the energy out, then the system is going to change and respond to it. And that's very simple. And the question is, how can we measure that? One of the big surprises for people may be that the greenhouse effect, as it's called, has, is, has very little to do with what actually happens in greenhouses. Most of us, you know, if you've been in a hot car in the summer, it gets very hot, and there, are, and there are a few reasons for that. One is indeed that the sun's rays come in the car and can go through the glass, but the, the heat radiation, so-called infrared radiation, can't get out of the glass, so that builds up. But that's just a small component of what keeps greenhouses or cars uh, warm. If you open the windows in a car, it cools off quite quickly. While the Earth doesn't have these windows, it has free exchange from the surface to the atmosphere, and people, therefore, who are suspicious of this would argue, well, the, you know, the greenhouse effect doesn't make sense. But in fact, the other thing that's perhaps surprising is that really much of the oomph of the greenhouse effect, as it's been called, doesn't happen at the Earth's surface, but the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. And what carbon dioxide does, you see, the Earth, if the Earth isn't going to change its temperature, the energy coming in from the sun inward has to be equal and opposite to the energy that the Earth is radiating back into space. And when that's the case, the Earth is in equilibrium. But what happens is that the carbon dioxide um, basically reduces the amount of energy being radiated back into space. Why? Because the more carbon dioxide there is, the more opaque the atmosphere becomes. And the point in the atmosphere where you can freely radiate into space is higher up. And at a higher up elevation, it's colder. And there's a simple law of physics that says that something radiates as the fourth power of its temperature. So when the Earth is radiating at a higher altitude and it's colder, it's radiating less energy. And we can actually calculate and measure that about three watts per square meter, it, uh, more energy is coming in from the sun than going out into space right now because of the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's a, it, so the fact that it's happening at the surface of the atmosphere is, is uh, another surprise, I think. The, uh, the last one, which maybe, which surprised me when I first first uh, recognizes we talk about sea level rise, which is going to be significant. Uh, 
And people think, well, there's all these uncertainties because it's melting of glaciers or melting of the ice sheet and, and Greenland, all of which are happening to some extent. But what's surprising is that sea level rise, at least 50% of sea level rise that's occurred already, and maybe 40 to percent of what will happen in the in the, in the, at least the, uh, uh, the first half of the century is due to the simple fact that the additional heat in the earth causes the water to expand. As water heats up, it expands. It takes a long time for that, the oceans to equilibrate that. But uh, here's a rather striking number. For the last 25 years, the oceans have increased in temperature by 0 0.07 degrees Celsius, which seems like very little, but there's a lot of water there. And when you work it out, that's equivalent to having exploded 3.4 billion Hiroshima level atomic bombs in the ocean over the last 25 years. Four atomic bombs every second, 24 hours a day for the last 25 years. That's the additional heat that's coming in. And, and so sea level rise is, it's, that's basic physics. You can't argue against it. And that's more or less viable. We've already put that heat in and the, it's going to take time for the oceans to, to equilibrate that. And, and, and I guess the last thing, and, and one of the reasons that maybe dealing with climate change is more urgent than it might be otherwise. It's not that, as some people may say, that in 12 years the world is going to end. That's not going to happen, at least not due to climate change. But what hap But all of the carbon dioxide we add in the atmosphere changes the abundance of the atmosphere, and that stays in the atmosphere. I called it the Las Vegas effect. What happens in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere. And so the, the carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere now, that abundance, which is now bigger than it's been at any point in the last million years' history, that's going to take, even if we stop today, that'll take 600 or 1,000 years. And even after that point, it's still about 60% of it is still going to be in the atmosphere. So it means that every year we delay acting. It's more of a challenge because if we're interested in capping the carbon at some final level, every year we, we keep adding it, we get closer and closer to that level and it becomes, means the next year we'll have to be more dramatic in our cuts. And so the, the urgency doesn't come from some immediate effect. Because climate change will happen gradually, and it's already happening. That's the other important thing. It's not in the future. It's already happening. But, but the, 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 the impact, what's called radiative forcing, the additional energy being trapped in the Earth, that, that continues and will continue because the carbon dioxide is there. So we want to act sooner rather than later, simply because if we'd acted 10 years ago, we add about 10 gigatons, 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere each year. If we started what we're is being proposed to do now a decade ago, that would be about a hundred billion tons of carbon that's now there. Well, about only about fifty percent of it actually stays there. Fifty percent goes in the ocean. So fifty billion tons of carbon that we wouldn't have to worry about that's there already, and that'll be there for the next four hundred or a thousand years. So those are some 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 aspects of this. The fact that. That it, you know, sure to understand the detail aspect of the climate and the, maybe the impact of clouds and how and how ocean currents are going to affect Europe. Yeah, you'll need supercomputers to really model radio transfer in the atmosphere and differential heating. But the basic physics is well understood, and it's and it, and moreover, the predictions you can make, as I show in the book, with very simple models, which I think anyone with a high school math level can understand you could predict that the Earth's temperature would have increased by about one degree or so since 1900, and it has. And, and um, you know, so if it walks like a quack, duck and quacks like a duck, it's, it's probably a duck. So I want to come back to the, the carbon capture um, options, perhaps maybe in a few minutes if we have time, but I want to talk a little bit about one of your uh, older books uh, that's been very popular as well is The Universe from Nothing. And here you, uh, in that book, you indicate um, that in regards to string theory, that we still have no idea if this remarkable theoretical ed edifice actually has anything to do with the real world. Uh, so I wonder if you could elaborate. And uh, really, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around is, um, you know, this this theme of that we've discovered all science suggests a universe that could plausibly arise from really nothing. And in the absence of space itself, that one day will return to nothing um, and, and, and so forth. So I want to kind of give you some time to kind of elaborate on that sure. and uh, questions related to it as well. Don't forget to visit astroperkins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Julianne Hugh, 
actress, dancer, and winner of Dancing with the Stars. Damien Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroperkins.com and click on events. What, yeah, I mean, that book was was pretty popular, I think, because it addressed a, a question that 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 everyone's asked and is, is really a central part of modern religions. You know, how can you get something from nothing? Uh, uh, how can you create a universe containing 100 billion galaxies, each containing 100 billion stars without some supernatural shenanigans? And the remarkable thing is you can. I think that's that was I wanted to discuss the revolutions in cosmology over the last 60 or 70 years. But. But I also wanted to address this really remarkable fact that you you that looks like you can get the ultimate free lunch, that the total energy of our universe it can be precisely zero because gravity had, allows kind of negative energy as well as positive energy. So you can start with a system with no energy, create this universe, literally create space and time by properties of quantum mechanics, which again, if if we have a theory of gravity, a quantum theory of gravity, and as you pointed out, string theory is a purported what may one day be a quantum theory of gravity, but it isn't yet, or at least not a quantum theory of the gravity that describes our universe. We're not sure of that. But in quantum mechanics says that systems, quantum fluctuations happen all the time. In, in this room, there are particles burping in and out of existence on time scales so short you can't measure them. But in quantum mechanics, uh, in gra if you have quantum mechanics and gravity, then space and time themselves become quantum mechanical objects. And you could literally burp space times out of into existence that didn't exist before most of them will disappear in a fraction of an instant but the amazing thing is some of them can persist for longer times if they have zero total energy and if you asked and to me this is the most remarkable thing which we can show to be plausible we don't have a full theory of it but if you asked what would a universe look like that was 14 billion years old that had popped into existence spontaneously through the laws of physics uh, and, and lasted 14 billion years, what would it look like? Well, it would generically have the characteristics that are precisely the characteristics of the universe we observe today. Does that prove that was the case? No, but it makes it plausible. And I find it remarkable that science has progressed to the point where we can even ask that question and have a plausible potential answer. And of course, in my mind, every time you get rid of any myth or superstition, it's also a good thing. But that's a you know, and some people are offended by the fact that, you know, it argues that you don't need a God to create a universe. And it's true. It doesn't argue that no God can exist, but it just says we don't need one. And I think that's progress because um, it is remarkable that we can, if we can understand this really all important human question, which is what's the origin of our own universe. And that is one of the biggest questions in, in human history. Another one is, are we alone? alone? And perhaps another one is, how, you know, where does consciousness come from? These are big questions. And We've made a tremendous amount of progress to even address questions, which when I was a graduate student, I never thought were even addressable. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess the question I'm going to be asking is, I'm not sure if it's within the realm of physics, but, you know, given the fact that when we look at it, you know, human species in the context of uh, really the, the creation of the universe and the, the, at some point, potentially the death of it as well, because uh, all energy matter will essentially dis dissipate and decay. Is uh, yeah, the, the energy matter will decay. The universal yeah. and, and as the universe expands, things get farther and farther apart, and most will be just right. empty and dark and cold. That's the future. That's okay. correct. So why are we working so hard to keep our human species alive when, in the long term, perhaps maybe it's it's really not the right question we should be asking. Well, I think the answer to that is the same question is why do you want to be alive yourself? The point is that we, we are here for a short time to, and it's a remarkable, remarkable, almost miraculous, but not miraculous, remarkable fact that we have evolved a consciousness, an awareness so we can appreciate the universe, we can ask questions about it, we can experience all of the wonder of being human in every way, and we should celebrate that. And so I think it's incredibly important that while, that, you know, we're, who knows how much life there is in the universe but due to a fortunate series of circumstances our earth being in the edge of a galaxy probably being not having a lot of action there could have been the universe is would otherwise be trying to kill us in many ways with exploding stars and everything else for four billion years more or less four and a half billion years but four billion years since life first evolved we, the earth has been habitable 
remarkable. Maybe there are other habitable planets in the universe. We're looking for them right now. But it, it may be so rare that life is incredibly rare in our galaxy and in many galaxies. And then it's more, in some sense, it's more special. Sure, the long-term future of the Earth is the, the sun's eventually going to envelop the Earth when it becomes a red giant. Yeah, in, in, in 5 billion years. And, and, and even before that, it, it will heat up in about 2 billion years. So there'll be a runaway, runaway greenhouse effect, very different of the type we're forming now. But maybe human civilization can, if they know about these problems, we can, you know, permeate the galaxy, we can move out and, and some people are talking about, you know, moving away from the earth or at least having multiple outposts so that all our eggs are not in one basket. But I don't worry about that as much as I worry about the fact that we should celebrate our existence. And, and, and because of that incredible fortunate circumstance, rather than worrying about the end of life in the universe or the end of our own lives, we should celebrate our brief moment in the sun. So, so that's an interesting um, observation and comment, which is that, um, you know, if we, from a fact uh, that uh, just like many of the past species have come and gone, uh, is that if our livelihood or longevity or survival is in question, um, you know, that we're still putting so much effort and energy and resources into surviving today. Uh, and you put in the context of celebration, and I wonder celebration is it just among ourselves or celebration and because to me when i think of celebration it's in the context of uh, of something right uh, it's and it, again surviving in itself i wonder if it should be celebration or if it's surviving because of perhaps maybe the way it's been created for us so again i know you're uh, anti-theist uh, and uh, well, you're I, very much against the kind of this notion of religion, that religion is superstition and uh, this kind of dogmatic approach in pop culture. But I wonder, you know, that there's still value in having that uh, perspective, uh, again, call it a maker or something else, but maybe again, that celebration without the audience or without the maker just doesn't seem like celebration to me. Well, I, you know, it depends whatever floats your boat. I think the point is that we can all come together regardless of that kind of belief and recognize that there's something worth celebrating. The universe is remarkable. And I think that's, in the best of all religions, that's a fact that, that, that is celebrated. It's true that religion celebrates it in terms of thanking some maker, but, but we don't, whether or not we buy that, it seems to me it's undeniable that this remarkable planet and universe that we live in is worth celebrating and it's worth celebrating by understanding and experiencing and learning about just like as a human being um children can celebrate their life without always thanking their parents they can celebrate that they can in some sense do honor if you want to call it that to their parents by living the best and most fruit fruitful life they can and experiencing as much of the human condition that they can and and as well as love Experience, experiencing all of the emotions that humans can do. So I, I don't see, you know, I think a celebration, I can celebrate my birthday without, without you know, my parents being there. I can celebrate the, 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 my good fortune. Um, and I think it's, I personally think it's, it's a healthy thing to do, to have a positive attitude of celebration. No doubt evolution has built in the need, uh, you know, the human imperative for survival. It does in all species. If it didn't, then, you know, the, they wouldn't survive as effectively. So, yes, we want to survive as individuals and as a species. Unfortunately, we often don't think about what the West, best way to survive as a species is. And I think it's important to step back. And that's why when it comes to nuclear weapons or climate change, we need to think, think globally in a way that evolution really didn't prepare us to do. But I guess um, if you feel the need to celebrate by thanking your maker, that's fine, but we're all celebrating the same thing, which is the remarkable uh, existence of life and the world around us. Um, so so th thank you, thank you for, for, for your perspective on that. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that, that's, that's a challenge, I think for most of us is because we're living in a capitalistic society, we think of celebration in a certain context, which tends to be more consumerism or consumption, but I wonder, in the few minutes that we have left, if you could talk about society from a physics perspective, um, not just in terms of just consuming, surviving for the sake of survival and celebrating that, but uh, you know, from a physics point of view, 
you know, how would you describe, let's, like, again, it's not, it's a very poor term, but, but let's call it the economy. Well, look, you know, um, I view certain things as a physicist. I step out of my picture as a physicist when I'm celebrating a Mozart concerto or, or even watching a science fiction movie where the science may be wrong. I, I enjoy the story. I think, um, I, I think that what, as a physicist, what, I, what, what is important to me is when we look at anything like the economy or healthcare or nationalism or immigration or all of the things that we need to, to deal with as a, as, a, as a society and as a culture is that we look at it rationally, that we allow, and by rationally, I mean, we look at the realities. We're not, we're not afraid to ask questions and go wherever they lead us. We all have biases. We all want to believe. And one of the great things that science and physics teaches us is how to question ourselves. And every day we should be questioning our assumptions about what we think um, is natural or appropriate and, and opening up our eyes and our minds to the possibility that we might be wrong. Then when we talk about economics and talk about proposals and policies that may help people, look to see what the empirical evidence that they might have, that, that goes into that policy. And then if after you've done it, check it. And if it doesn't work, do something else. That's the way it works in science. We do experiments. If it doesn't work, if the experiment doesn't work or the theory doesn't work, we move on to do something else. We're not afraid of throwing out a dear, an idea that's so dear to us that you think it's central to our being. In science, we're not afraid of throwing it out like yesterday's newspaper if the evidence suggests it's wrong. Well, I wish that was the case. And, and certainly, uh, as a trained economist, um, you know, I was often told that many of the solutions that have already been published, but yet uh, it doesn't quite translate into policy policies. Uh, yeah, today yeah we got economics very... is, you know, I'm often, I've been to the Nobel Prize ceremonies and often amazed, and I know a lot of economists, I'm winning the Nobel Prize, but I'm kind of amazed that uh, economics is an area where you can win Nobel Prize and then be proved wrong uh, three years later pretty quickly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anyway. So with that, I've been joined by Dr. Lawrence Cross, who is a retired professor, author of The Physics of Star Trek, A Universe from Nothing, and Physics of Climate Change. Thanks for joining today. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.